Thank you. Hello. Um, Hello. So here we go. Co-creation in social leadership. Um, as uh, any of you that haven't been on one of these uh, Explorer webinars before, Explorer sessions, uh, they're very relaxed, somewhat unstructured. Um, this is the third time going through the social leadership series. So I'm trying not simply to take you on a tour of, um, of the work and, and the structure of the book. Uh, I'm really trying to use it to bring in some of the thoughts and experiences around the side of it. Um, and sometimes to talk about some of uh, this work going into practice, how we do something practical with it. Um, Co-creation is one of the most interesting areas, which is another way of saying it may be particularly reflective and unstructured because um, if you like, co-creation is, is the prize. It's the thing that we're hoping uh, to get, uh, by which I mean, if we, look, if we look beyond the organization as a formal structure with all of the great strength and brilliance that it has, we're delving into the social structure of the organization, the invested uh, energy and effort of uh, everybody within an organization. And this is really the sort of the magic piece. Functional investment is quite easy to get. You can pay somebody for functional investment. They'll turn up, they'll do the job, and they'll smile and make you a cup of tea. But they may not be invested uh, in helping the organization to be better. Co-creation is really a, a core feature of the social age, the way that we come together to actually make sense of something and do something about it. So this session is, is really exploring, if you like, what is co-creation? How do we create the conditions for co-creation to occur in terms of establishing communities, understanding the rules, understanding mechanisms of, of reward and so on and so forth? Uh, as ever, I'll probably say, I, I, I don't think I'm going to be giving you many answers. Um, I'm going to be taking you on a bit of a, a journey through it. Do throw your questions into the, um, into the chat box as we go, or we'll keep a bit of time at the end. Uh, we're quite a uh, small group, so we can also, uh, Sam can promote anybody to, to participant, and I think you're all already there, actually, so you can unmute yourself and just uh, shout out a question if you like. I'm perfectly happy with that. Just to contextualize this, as I say, it's a, a series of 12 webinars um, and we're in number nine. So in the overall journey of social leadership, we've thought about the, the foundations, how you choose your space uh, within the social system, how you understand how stories work, where our communities are and how we earn our reputation within those uh, communities. Uh, these final pieces, co-creation, social capital and collaboration or complex collaboration are really where we get the output from it. So what is it that social leaders are able to do perhaps more effectively than people who are purely using formal authority? So this really is the, the nature of our social leadership journey to become more effective. I will sort of start with um, this point because whilst I've already used that word reflection a few times and you know to an extent the nature of my own work is 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 quite reflective um you know research based and reflective ultimately it's quite purposeful so how do we help people to be more effective how do we help organizations to change how do we help them to do better and to do all of that in the context of the evolving ecosystem of the social age. So, you know, what do we mean by co-creation? Um, I, I've, I've, I wrote this piece actually when I was writing the 100 Days book, where I said it's a mindset whereby we hear the views of others to help make them strong. Hello, I 
I'm not sure if anyone else can hear Julian right now. I'm afraid I can't. No, not at the moment. Okay, let me just uh, see if I can contact Julian. I think he has joined, rejoined. Hi, Julian, you dropped out for a minute there. Yes, so I see it's a Zoom kind of cycled through. Let me uh, seem to restart itself quite happily. Um, let me just reshare the screen. Sorry about that. Uh, and let me just bring back up the uh, question box so that I can see that. There we are. Um, okay, and you can hear me okay now, Sam? Yeah, loud and clear, thanks, Julian. And we can see the slides. Technology. Um, <laughs> so I think I was saying it's um, hearing the views of others, but not just the views that we want to hear. It's about hearing views that we may not agree with, indeed, that we may not want to hear, and helping make them stronger, which may sound slightly perverse, because, you know, typically we may seek to crush and destroy the uh, dissenting views. But of course, this is about, uh, this is part of an overall story about how we make our organizations more socially dynamic, how we uh, make them more interconnected. And I, I use that term interconnectivity uh, very deliberately. We, it's easy, it's comparatively easy to build functional strength. So in a, in a domain-based organization, one which is, is vertically divided by specialisms, by functions, it's reasonably easy to build a, an empire within one of those. A socially dynamic organization will be much more interconnected and that will involve crossing into areas of disagreement and difference and finding consensus-based views going forward. And I had a very interesting um, experience around this uh, weekend before last, working uh, on a, a retreat with 12 um, senior um, military and government leaders in the US, looking at stories of difference and dissent. Uh, so that included people from across the political spectrum. And, you know, I found myself in this really fascinating space where having a conversation with a, a, a policy director for one of the uh, senators who, you know, d doesn't believe that climate change is a thing. And I do believe climate change is a thing. And it, it was really, for me, uh, an important uh, experience because the challenge is that I, I have a strong view and I'm not going to change my view. Uh, I, I may, you know, if you show me some clear evidence, maybe I will, but uh, basically I have a view which I'm convinced is right. He had a view that he was convinced was right. And it just happened to be uh, a polar opposite of my view. So we were trying a technique of writing stories of difference to see if we could understand exactly where our difference lay. And, and interestingly, one of the uh, what we were able to do by doing that was deconstruct the uh, nature of difference slightly and understand that specifically we differed around uh, opportunity and job creation quite interestingly. So uh, climate change was the thing we were talking about, but underneath it he was bringing a political viewpoint about how do people in this um, area retain and build jobs. And I was bringing perhaps more of an ideological view of how do we prevent a global catastrophe. But the, the, the point is that it's easy to agree with people that you agree with. It's easy to co-create with people who you like and adore. It's reasonably hard to do it in complex, fractured cultures of organizations. And yet, if we want to change organizations, we will have to learn uh, to do that. I've said here it happens in high-functioning communities. Um, and that in itself is interesting because community is something where I've shifted my views quite significantly over the last four years or so. Um, the Social Leadership Handbook, incidentally, is four years old this month. The first edition came out four years ago. Um, and at that time, I wrote about communities being entities with shared value and shared purpose. But today, uh, I write about communities much more as social structures, trust bonded meta-tribal structures in fact so a, a tribe is a, a trust-based group 
and communities, at least in an organizational sense, typically consist of the members of many different tribes. But almost the only thing that you can be sure of when it comes to talking about communities is that uh, they are coherent through exclusion, uh, interestingly enough. So to be a community, almost by definition, there is somebody out there who is not a member of the community. That's pretty much the only uh, generalized definition I, I felt I could come up with. Um, but nonetheless, this point remains, co-creation happens within communities that have a certain something about them. I don't think it's something we can take for granted. I think we have to understand the motivations, the inhibitors, the mechanisms of, uh, mechanisms of reward, structures of power in which uh, co-creation will take place. Um, dynamic, adaptive and evolutionary is important because of course, one of the things we're trying to do with social uh, learning approaches and within our, our socially dynamic organization is not to surface one answer, it's to have a deep seated capability to come up with multiple answers and to understand that uh, uh, agile in the context of organizations doesn't just mean the ability to discover one new truth. It means the ability to consistently uh, adapt and change and uncover the truth. And that capability will most likely be held in our communities. Um, on that note, although slightly to the side, I just wanted to share this as a, a new slide for a, for a session that I'm running next week, looking at um, the reality of learning. And uh, I share this because uh, this is um, looking at uh, how the nature of knowledge is changing and how learning within organizations is changing. Uh, the rapid iteration of our approach to learning is significant. We are learning how to learn better within our new environment. We're seeing a rapid diversification of technologies, almost all of which are beyond organizational ownership or control. In the research we did in the National Health Service earlier this year, we, we asked um, people where they, uh, which technologies they used in order to be effective, to learn effectively, um, to be effective. And they identified 17 different technologies they used on a daily basis, only one of which was owned by the NHS. So 16 of which they were specifically forbidden from using in any kind of um, with any kind of client uh, patient data or, or, or open approaches and yet they use them and this is the nature of the social age you know technology is everywhere but we live in an ecosystem way beyond the formal technologies given to us by organizations the fragmentation of power is of course particularly relevant for social leadership because um, formal power does not carry very far into these social spaces. Instead, we see the, the types of power structures held within tribes, the uh, types of power structures that impose formal, uh, sorry, social consequence, and reputational authority within communities all come to bear. And the evolution of knowledge itself is, is very significant, not at a superficial level, but at a really deep um, what you could call an epistemological level, the ways of knowing, the nature of knowledge is almost certainly changing. And it's changing in a really key way. We're moving away from an age of the centralization of knowledge held within formally recognized expert networks and held within formal, often geolocated centers of knowledge towards a place where knowledge is substantially distributed in terms of geography it's, it's uh, democratized in terms of access, but also crucially, the validity, the mechanisms of validation of knowledge are shifting significantly. And uh, apologies if I don't want to get too heavy in this, but the, um, essentially, this isn't a story about fake news and, and echo chambers. It's something more significant than that. We are tending to employ more of a distributed network for validation. So the people within our network who are high status, high reputation, credible, we, to some extent, are outsourcing responsibility for validation to those people, whilst previously we were probably outsourcing it to um, formal mechanisms of validation. If I sound fairly unclear as I explain that, it's because I am still fairly unclear but I am pretty clear that it's changing and it's significant. Uh, so let's come back to co-creation 
specifically what kind of things might we want to think about if we are trying to build a more socially dynamic organization if we are developing social leadership in order to do this the kind of questions we might ask what is the impetus for co-creation so that is to recognize that co-creation is a um, discretionary activity I, I normally say that uh, co-creation is not like a, a pile of gold sat on the floor. There is not this brilliance of the community sat there just waiting for you to pick it up. It, it is instead something that we have to earn the right to have. So we have to understand what is the impetus for people to engage? What are the incentives by which they engage? And I'll come back to that in a moment. And how do we maintain momentum in action? And th these are, are quite significant. Just think about a, a couple of those things. What are the incentives to engage in co-creation? Well, I've got a few lines of research running at the moment that are uh, casting some insights into this, but I can only share what I would say is a provisional answer, not a definitive one. Um, one obvious mechanism uh, by which we invest in co-creation is for financial reward. Um, but it turns out that that's a very low motivator. In the landscape of trust research, only something like 14% of people said that uh, that was a primary reason for them to uh, invest within the uh, culture and community. Um, for most people, it was about building legacy and opportunity. So legacy is important because in the context of um, fragmented careers and uh, the latest research i've seen shows that in the us people will have on average 42 different jobs within what we will loosely call a career in the uk it's around 36 or 38. Um, so the return for your willing investment of your brilliance is effectively some kind of future opportunity um, opportunity which incidentally is most likely to come from your community rather than from the organization itself. The, another strand which is, has, seems to be reasonably relevant for this is around pride and power. And when you ask people where they find pride, the, um, the number one place they say they, they typically find it is through the success and achievements of others. The second place they typically find it is in helping others to be successful. And only the third place is in their own personal individual achievements. Now, that is, of course, just asking people where they feel they find it. So it's not a hard measure in that sense. But what it seems to indicate is that there is a great space with the potential for people to invest themselves in. Indeed, another feature of the landscape of trust research, which was relevant here, is when we asked a simple question, if your organization trusts you, how will that trust be manifest? 54% uh, of people said, if the organization trusts me, they will give me freedom. So whilst 14% wanted money, 54% wanted freedom. And within that freedom, they want to do these things. They want to create things. They want to help others to create things and be successful. They want to experiment. They want to uh, invest in storytelling. There are a whole ton of things that they want to do. So co-creation is complicated. Um, it's clearly not simply a matter of technology, although it will very likely be facilitated and enabled by technology. It's clearly not simply a function of reward, although conversely, reward and recognition is a feature of co-creation. And probably most importantly, it's certainly not something we can take for granted as both formal leaders and social leaders, we almost certainly have to work on creating the conditions in which co-creation uh, will occur. Now, um, just give me a sec, I'm losing my voice slightly today, so uh, a, a spot of tea will help. Um, this is uh, something that I'm, I'm sharing here. Um, I wouldn't sh have shared this if we were just taking a kind of a one track through social leadership. But um, as I said earlier, this is the third track through it. The recordings of the previous sessions are, are, are online. So if you, you, know, if you, if you uh, want to see the clean pass through it, then feel free to look at that. This is a 
model which uh, I was developing looking at cultural health, uh, community health, the health of learning communities. And this uh, particular uh, quarter of it looks at uh, reasons why people engage in communities. And I'm sharing this because it's a summary of um, a piece of research I did in one of the banks, actually, looking at why people engage. Um, so there's probably nothing here which will surprise us too much, but there are a couple of words that are quite interesting. Obviously, people engage because they're interested. Well, we shouldn't uh, underestimate that. Although I would point out that in many of the organisations I work in, access to learning is restricted, which is quite interesting. They say, you know, well, it's not your job. It's not the right time. This isn't signed off for you. So you can't engage. But um, curiosity and interest are key reasons people seek to engage. And in the wider world, that's why we've seen the explosion of the MOOCs and indeed the explosion of podcasts, because people are interested in a ton of stuff. So it's worth remembering that people engage and will engage because they're interested. Um, there's some interesting ones here. Voyeurism is quite interesting. People engage because they want to see what others are doing. Well, that's not in itself a bad thing, uh, especially if you're looking at social movements. I'm doing some really fascinating work at the moment in some NGOs, um, looking at how do we create social movements for change. And there, there is quite often an aspect of voyeurism within this. It's, it's a hard word to use because it has a bit of a negative connotation, but that's kind of what we see with a lot of the spaces NGOs operate in. It's sort of looking into the lives of others who are less fortunate than us. And there is a sort of a, a voyeurist tendency. Uh, we're not passing judgment here. We're just saying, you know, voyeurism is actually a reason why people say they engage in, in these spaces. Um, generosity is quite a key one. Um, uh, people like to be generous. And uh, in fact, just yesterday, I, I was writing about uh, tokens, totems, uh, rituals and gifts and understanding the gift economy of your organization is actually an extremely valuable thing to do how are gifts given how are they received what are the rituals around those things and you can put these into practice uh, very easily so one uh, way i've been able to do that which was one of the petrochemical companies where we explicitly worked with the managers of the teams from which people came to, to take part in some leadership development work. We worked with them on the ritual and choreography of how they welcomed people back from the training. Because previously what they'd done is when people went off to do some, some learning, they would kind of you know, ridicule them. Oh, you know, you've been off enjoying a, a free bar and a holiday. But what we wanted to get them to do was, was get them to welcome people back saying, thank you, you know, thanks for taking time out of your every day to help us be better as a team. Um, here's, a, here's a story listening space where we will listen to the things that you've learned. Um, building their capability to run experiments off the back of that, to, to learn from it, is quite interesting. But personally, I think that understanding rituals, uh, choreography, and the power of artifacts within um, organizational culture, social culture, is an extremely valuable place to, um, to start. So this is one of the illustrations from the uh, Social Leadership 100 Days book. If, uh, incidentally, if um, I recognize a, a, a few um, names of explorers in the uh, attendees here, if, um, so some of you may already have the 100 Days book, but if you don't yet, just um, uh, ping a note to either myself or Sam, and I'll happily send you a, a copy over. The, um, the 100 Days book has this uh, quite provocation, really, to remember that when we're considering anything within a, a social space, we're not, uh, we're never going to be perfect, which is a, a great reassurance uh, for, for me, if for nobody else, because um, perfection is, is not a state we uh, attain and retain forever. Uh, we may, you know, perhaps have a, a one moment of brilliance where we do something perfectly, but then of course, uh, context changes, we change, uh, we don't get it right again. So, Co-creation is very much this uh, collaborative, complex collaborative, community-based piece. But it's worth remembering that when we're talking about co-creation, we can probably do worse than start by looking at ourselves. 
where is our own willful blindness? Where is our own uh, arrogance, actually? And, you know, where are the things that we uh, believe that we know, which it turns out perhaps we could explore a little, a little further? Um, I'll just, I think we've got time to briefly touch on this. I won't get too deep into it, but this is another strand of work, which I've not published yet, actually, but which I found uh, very interesting. For the last few years, I've been interviewing uh, musicians uh, about the experience of creativity and, and hope uh, at some point when I feel I can give it the attention it deserves, I'll, I'll publish this as a, a full book about uh, creativity um, and really looking at it from two perspectives, the, the neurological basis of it, how, how we um, individually uh, are creative in terms of thinking outside established frames of reference. So really creativity is the, as a foundation for innovation. Um, but the second thing, which is very interesting, came across very strongly. I've interviewed about 40 musicians so far, and they describe the mechanism of creativity like this. About 25% of them say they can only be creative in isolation. So they need to be locked away uh, by themselves in order to be creative. They cannot stand trying to do that with other people. About 50% say they can only be creative with other people. So this is the kind of classic view of a, a garage band, I guess, you know, four teenagers locked away in a room, kicking stuff about. Um, so that's their lived experience. And there seems to be quite a strong neurological basis for that as well. Um, within trusted groups, I should say. There's a reason why bands spectacularly uh, fragment because they, they uh, are testing the boundaries of, of trust, actually, in many ways. The third way is quite interesting. About 25% of people say they can only be creative through performance. So they, they put it together in isolation, but it's only, if you like, in the application and in, in a continuous looping cycle of performance and recreation that they are able to be creative. Um, and what you see generally is, is this, there are, there are internally moderated aspects of creativity, which are, if you like, unconstrained freedom. So when you're just dealing with yourself, in, unless you're one of these people that can endlessly argue with yourself, you can pretty much get away with whatever you like. Um, but most creativity, even at what we assume is a sort of individual level, tends to be externally moderated and within a structure, which is quite interesting when we're looking at things like innovation or co-creation in organizations much creativity actually happens in reference to um, existing materials or within a structure not i should be clear a an innovation process um, but rather um, uh, cognitive and conceptual models of understanding so uh, i won't get further into that now but uh, understanding the nature of creativity, I think, is something which, which is worth further exploration as we're trying to build our organisations to be more um, socially dynamic to, uh, and, quite frankly, to build uh, a viable future. Um, I'll just pause there and thank you for bearing with me through that because uh, I realise we are dotting around a little bit today. I know I said we would, but there we are. That's the nature of things. Um, Co-creative power is uh, a sort of a conversation about energy uh, as much as anything. Uh, I'm having an interesting uh, conversation at the moment. I, I, I've worked now for seven years with the Sharif Blair Foundation for Women, which is a mentoring organization that matches mentors in the US and the UK up with women in developing and emerging economies who are running these micro businesses. And um, I work with them on the design of that mentoring program. There's about 3000 people going through that this year. But I also act as a mentor on the program. This is my seventh year doing that. So I, I'm mentoring a really wonderful woman in, um, in India who is running a small business that trains other women in investment. So how to read the stock market, how to make investments. And um, there is a point to this story. I will get to it. Uh, and she uh, at the, will run that mentoring relationship for a year. And... The uh, thing we've been focusing on so far is energy, where your energy goes. Uh, because it turns out that none of us are, are superhuman. Uh, obviously, we're all brilliant, but not necessarily superhuman. And there are distinct currencies 
which we operate in. One is a currency of time. And of course, it's true, there's only so many um, hours in the day. One is a currency of money, but one is a currency of emotional energy and, you know, potentially co-creative power. And so the thing I've been doing with her is we've been talking about, you know, how much of your uh, time, if you like, is under your control and how much gets stolen. And it's very common that people say, um, I don't have time. That's absolutely the most common reason people state why they're unable to affect change. They, don't get me wrong, they know something needs to change. They're absolutely intent on affecting change. And then when you ask them why they've been unable to, it's because they say they don't have time. The really interesting thing is if you give people time, they typically still don't affect change because it turns out there's a specific capability in this as well. But the thing that's worth considering is how and where and when do we spend this power? And of course, how, where and when do we recharge this power? because it becomes a question of resource management. In, in our organizations, we're typically pretty good at formal resource management. So your organization probably has a mechanism whereby it knows that you have a laptop that they own, and it probably knows whether it's paid you your salary this month or not. What it almost certainly doesn't have is any kind of ability to measure uh, social capital, um, and the co-creative energy of, uh, that we're investing in these communities. Well, you know, maybe we should be considering this. Are we asking everybody to work flat out all the time? Or are we actually going to make some attempts to marshal and conserve and build that power? Uh, and it comes down to this mindset piece that I started with. If we just assume that the people in our organizations are like little batteries running around and it's perfectly within our rights to draw current from them when we wish, we'll probably be sorely disappointed because it turns out that whilst you can buy people's time, you can't buy their willing investment because it's willing. They have to make the decision to invest themselves in what they're doing. And that switches the focus of leadership away from tra transactional demands or assumption-based engagement towards creating the conditions uh, in which people may willingly engage. Um, this is a sort of jump from this right back to a rather elementary thing. You know, what is the, the point of uh, co-creation? Well, at a sort of fairly simple level, it helps to filter stuff out. So individually, we can be creative, but by operating within um, community-based approaches, we can filter out more of the noise, we can bring a broader range of perspectives, we can employ multiple different filters, not just the ones that we have and can master, and we can understand the underlying signal. And this becomes extremely important when we think about things like resilience um, uh, and how we avoid disruption. So it's worth considering there's a real um, sort of tactical advantage to an organization that can foster um, really broad and diverse co-creation. These, uh, these last couple of illustrations have been from the 100 Days book. Um, bias is also important. If we, um, you know, we, we must always remember that no matter how uh, diverse our community is, almost by definition, it's still exclusive. It's still likely to be made up of people who are somewhat like us in some ways. So as we think about our ability to co-create and in, in the context of social leadership, as we choose which communities to be part of and which to leave and which to grow, we should be actively considering this. How do we actively diversify our communities? How do we build our capability to storytell across difference? Um, in fact, if you're um, interested in this. Uh, I'm just working at the moment, we, I'm launching next month um, a new certification. It's going to be the first of the social leadership certifications on storytelling and social leadership. And it explicitly looks at um, how we curate stories of difference. So again, if you're interested in that, give me a note and I'll show you the, uh, have me share the, the materials behind this. And I, I, indeed, I've, I've written a couple of posts on some of the techniques around that on, on, on the blog. Um, and this is a slightly uh, tangential, but again, sort of important uh, to remember. 
organizations tend to be good at telling certain types of stories and they're good at it in two ways they are structurally good at it so if they produce newsletters or uh, corporate briefing videos or publish uh, in magazines they tend to be good at the mechanisms of e e editorial and uh, production and distribution but they're also good at it culturally in terms of telling stories that they think wants to be heard um, the really interesting thing is so, you know so we effectively build organizations as story machines very good at telling stories that are known and safe and accepted when uh, in one of the uh, tech companies have just run a, a research project across two and a half thousand people globally asking them what the most um, important things are that they look for in social leadership and they identified uh, just under 70 different uh, things they look for and the number one thing is authentic storytelling so um, it's interesting, a, a, a machine-based approach, which understands the mechanisms of story creation and distribution is one thing, but some of the skills we may need to consider as social leaders are, are story listening. Um, and that was a very clear result from some other work I've been doing on a cultural readiness for change diagnostics. I've run this in three organizations with around a thousand people in each, so quite large scale testing. And what it shows quite clearly is that people are, are, are generally quite comfortable with the formal stories that organizations tell. They don't have any kind of innate hatred of, uh, you know, formal leaders telling stories. On, on the contrary, they're often quite interested in them. Um, however, it seems to be very common that people feel utterly disempowered to respond to those stories. They either have no space or they have no permission. And it's worth considering those two things. Space is important, but permission is more important. Just having a comments box under a story doesn't make it okay for people to comment. And in fact, when you look at um, power and consequence, what you see very clearly is that the social consequence of disagreement is, if you like, the number one fear factor. So the reason that people don't challenge or engage isn't because they're not brilliant, it's because they're afraid of being excluded or, or judged. Um, and this is uh, hugely significant when we look at fractured and damaged cultures. Um, so I'd be looking there mainly at uh, some aspects of uh, financial service cultures quite commonly, um, some aspects of political cultures, uh, which is interesting because I'm, I'm working in a couple of government contexts at the moment uh, globally and, uh, and you see this is a, um, a consequence is a dominant um, inhibitor of learning and, and activity uh, and probably in healthcare contexts as well. So story listening is something that's well worth us uh, focusing on. Let's get sort of right back to co-creation. Um, if we look at what seems to uh, inhibit or enable engagement in co-creation. There are some quite fundamental things, you know, who owns the conversation is, is quite an important one. So, you know, if you're in an organization and you have the opportunity to engage in this incredible uh, problem solving, co-creative type of activity, sooner or later, the question will come up, well, who, who owns this brilliance? Um, and it com comes down, as I've mentioned before, to, you know, what, what are people looking for in return for their engagement? Uh, what is the organization looking for and what are we looking for individually? And how are we fair? I, I had a very interesting conversation this morning with a global organization, a very successful global organization, whose big focus uh, going forward is on uh, compassion within the culture of the organization. How do they build a compassionate culture? Um, and fairness is a, a key part of this. And again, I'll, I'll give you some of the um, uh, some of the ways I've been trying to approach this uh, experimentally. We've seen, for example, that when groups engaged in co-creator activities are given explicit ownership and control over aspects of visibility, permanence, and consequence. 
you can drive up engagement up to 16 fold. So for example, if groups are allowed to dictate who can see what they're doing, that can typically drive up engagement. If they get to determine how permanent the record is of the conversation, that drives up engagement. Um, it, it's, it's quite fascinating thinking about this. The research in the landscape of trust, which incidentally that research project is two years old, still going strong, uh, growing out at the moment. We've just got one of the um, uh, NHS trusts is just coming on board as a research partner. So again, if you're interested in the research, uh, there's a whole research community um, and you can, you can take part yourself or as an organization. But within that, uh, people draw a clear differentiation between, um, between uh, uh, create, co-creation to help the organization be more effective and activity which drives revenue for an organization. So whilst I said earlier that only 14% of people want financial reward from their invested engagement, that shifts if the output of co-creative activity directly drives revenue into the business. And in that context, 54% uh, of people want financial reward. And we shouldn't view those as bad people because remember what we're talking about here is is a willing investment over and above that which we get for their salary and eight hours a day. So effectively, uh, the way I read it is that people say, you know, if I'm tangibly and clearly helping the organization be more successful, then I want both recognition and financial reward. However, if I'm helping my community be successful in doing this purpose-led job that we're doing, I don't want financial reward. I want opportunity and freedom and the ability to, to, to invest myself in, in solving problems. So as per my conversation at the start, every aspect of social leadership happens within the context of complex social systems. And, you know, to sort of answer the last question of what's a complex social system, um, every social system is complex. So we won't find a clear answer. There's not going to be one clear set of rules that lets us build this phenomenal, beautiful, fair and effective organization. However, to be clear, it is possible to build that organization. And to be equally clear, we won't get it if we continue to do the things we've already done. We won't get it if we continue to operate in just purely the formal space with hierarchies of power, domain-based expertise and mechanisms of motivation and reward that operate in just a financial currency. We may get it if we build strong social networks, if we recognize, empower and enable the tribal structures of the organization, if we focus great effort on interconnectivity, if we lead with humility, if we build our compassionate culture, if we create spaces for people to invest in the ways they want to invest, and if we ensure that we do so in responsible ways, then we may unlock this incredible ability of a socially dynamic organization. I've mentioned uh, already, uh, this is probably a, a convenient moment for a slurp of tea. Um, the mechanisms of reward are fascinating. Um, uh, yesterday, I think Sam's already shared, I, I, I'm playing around with uh, talking to two organizations about doing this inside, but uh, some of my work I call the 1% work, which means 99% of it is probably wrong. But um, within that 1% work, I've been playing around with some ideas of the organization as ecosystem and a forest of social leaders. And it looks at how some of the trees in that forest are, are your formal leaders, some of your trees are social leaders, but a forest is not just trees. It's, it's the leaf mold on the ground, it's the, the rivers that run through it, it's the beetles, it's the weather, it's the shade and the breeze, it's all of this. And if we view the organization as an ecosystem, the thing we can see is that every single one of us draws something out. We all take something out of the ecosystem, but we also all put something into it. And the role of social leaders is perhaps to help the system to find balance. So within that, I'm playing around with some of these different currencies of reward. So we already talked about financial currency, do a good job, earn some money. 
But there are other currencies and you can measure some of them. And indeed, I've, I've been doing this in a few organisations. A simple one is a currency of thank yous. If you get to the end of the week and you give everybody in your team or your division or your organisation three coins, three coins that each say thank you, and you ask them to spend those coins, you can then look at an aggregated level, where do those coins get spent? And it's often very telling. You know, they typically cluster in certain places. But you can go further. You could give them three coins of thank you, and you could give them three coins which have no assigned currency, and say, create the currency and spend the currency. Um, and then people come up with all sorts of interesting words. So they talk about a challenge coin. I give you this coin because you've challenged me. I give you this coin because you've helped me subvert an inane process. That's quite a common one. Uh, I, I give you this coin because you've demonstrated empathy. Uh, you get all sorts of interesting currencies emerge. And again, you can track where they flow. So these are imperfect, but these are different spotlights we can shine upon the social uh, nature of the organisation. Let's uh, next year, as you may uh, know, is the 70th, uh, sorry, 50th, 50th anniversary of the uh, Apollo missions landing on the moon. Incredible, um, incredible uh, achievement. The, uh, the, the Saturn V rocket remains to this day the most complicated machine built by the hand of man, the most complicated one built uh, to incredible levels of precision, but with over a million parts within the machine and a clear understanding and expectation that over 10,000 of those parts would fail during takeoff. But the system was built with such redundancy uh, that uh, the, the, the thing as a whole got there. Uh, now, um, you could argue that the uh, Apollo um, moon landings were successful uh, because of the tried and tested brute force method. Uh, the United States spent a significant proportion of its gross domestic product to put a man, of course it was a man, um, on to the moon. Well, you, you know, it would be partly right to consider that. Um, to some extent, it's a function of money. If you hit the, the thing with a big enough hammer, you'll achieve some kind of effect. But if you look at the uh, program as a whole, in pretty much every aspect, what you see is the creation of thousands upon thousands of nested, highly effective, co-creative communities. If you read the history of mission control, it's absolutely fascinating because what you see is a group of 15 or 20 people who got together and had to start figuring out how will we do all of the hard thinking before we have to do it for real. That's effectively the, the, the remit of mission control is to codify everything so that when something goes pop, you've already done 99.99% of your thinking and you can trigger um, ways of problem solving at speed. But Ultimately, it was successful because of this balance between structure and highly effective co-creative communities. If you look at any of the pinch points in the history of mission control, the crises, they've not been solved from a book. They've been solved through the convergence of high functioning teams within structured systems and processes. So it, it's worth sort of considering this. Where is the strength of your organization? You can, funnily enough, you can actually do this as a diagnostic exercise where you get people to write the story of the effectiveness of the organization. Where are the foundations of your pride and power? And they write very different stories. Because it turns out that the formal view of an organization that says, well, we have an R&D department and a printing department and a logistics department is only part of the story. Uh, effectiveness really comes through the convergence of, of formal and social systems. Um, you know, again, uh, uh, back down to earth at a more practical and pragmatic level, we have to consider to what extent uh, everything we do either inhibits or enables collaboration 
And in the, uh, yeah, not the next webinar, the next webinar in this series is on social capital, but the one after is on collaboration and specifically complex collaboration. Um, these are the levers with which we have to learn how to tinker. Largely speaking, the formal organization is a well understood entity. We know how to build them and we know how to build them at scale. We understand how formal rules work. We understand how currencies of uh, recognition and, and reward work. We understand how uh, performance management works. You know, we understand pretty much every aspect of the formal organization. And incidentally, we also know how to change it, how to hire people, fire people, build things, break them down again. The social organization is a substantially unknown entity. We are learning how this operates. And it's worth considering at every stage, to what extent does the formal system inhibit or enable the good stuff we're trying to do? And how can we influence that? The only thing we know for sure is that we can't demand it. This is a very clear output from the landscape of trust work. Um, put simply, I cannot make you trust me. Uh, I can offer you a thousand pounds and it's unlikely to make you trust me. It may make you demonstrate the outward appearance of trust because let's be honest, a thousand pounds is a thousand pounds, but it's not going to make you trust me. In fact, if I start offering you 10,000 pounds to trust me, you're probably going to freak out that something is really wrong somewhere because trust is not something that flows through money for most people. I should say that the interesting point of the landscape of trust research is that it has uncovered a very broad definition of trust and for some people uh, trust and money actually is very closely related. Um, we're going to have to understand the forces of the social organization better and as social leaders we're going to have to recognize that these are currencies that we do not have in our wallet to spend. The best that we can hope to achieve is to create the conditions in which we may influence or create the opportunity for others to influence and affect um, uh, this kind of cultural shift. What would it look like culturally? Uh, this is from a body of work around the socially dynamic organization that uh, continue to evolve. This in particular illustration is one of the 70 draft illustrations for the change handbook, which is subtitled Building the Socially Dynamic Organization, which I'm hoping to put out at the end of the year. And, you know, what will a socially dynamic organization look like? Well, it will, it will host a, a broad diversity of thought. It will welcome uh, unconformity. So whilst the formal organization has typically built its codified strength on consistency, conformity, replicability uh, at scale, the socially dynamic one will do some of that, but it will also relish unconformity. It will have a strong ability to prototype to experiment, it will have layers of storytelling, only some of which will be in broad agreement, some of which may be highly subversive and disruptive. Uh, it will have a democratized potential, so people will have the opportunity to uh, engage and invest beyond that which their formal role may tell you uh, they're likely to. It will effectively be more fluid and dynamic across an organizational structure. Uh, it will be deeply fair. I mean, this much is clear. We will need organizations that are fair uh, and, you know, maybe compassionate um, and are responsible uh, not only to people within the organization, but to the broader community outside it, to uh, recognition that organizations exist through the permission and in service of broader society. Uh, society does not exist for the convenience of organizations. Um, and we'll probably see that uh, those organizations which are able to be mindful, to be reflective and socially dynamic, will have a chance of reaping incredible reward. Because as the ecosystem changes that we operate in, um, it's going to require a new, a new type of strength. Uh, I'm going to just jump through there because we're nearly out of time. In fact, I'm just going to go through here and uh, just remind you where we are on this journey. Thanks for bearing with me through the uh, 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 sl slightly uh, uh, ad hoc journey uh, this time around. We're down here at the 
bottom right in co-creation. The webinars around these first aspects, curation, storytelling, sharing, community, reputation and authority, um, all uh, online already. Um, we'll follow up uh, just with some of the links to some of the pieces that came out of there. Uh, any, if anybody has any questions, do throw them into the box. I'll hand, I'll hand you back to Sam uh, to do that. Before I do so, uh, I just have to remember the other thing. We, uh, last week, I celebrated launching the Trust Sketchbook, which is the first publication out of the landscape of trust research. In fact, there were two parts of it. The Trust Sketchbook, which is a, a half-complete um journey through 12 aspects of trust and you graffiti it and fill it out to complete it and with it the trust guidebook which is really based out, out of the research and uh shares some of the questions you may want to ask yourself or others around you as you explore your own landscape of trust i'm going to be um uh, uh, prototyping some workshops and other ideas around that so do stay stay connected if you're interested in that work but for now i shall hand you over to sam and uh let him handle any questions or wrap us up. Thank you very much, Julian. Thanks for a, a great introduction um, to this topic. The next session, as you can see on the wheel there, the net model, uh, is social capital. Uh, for those of you in the UK, that's 2 p.m. and that's on the 9th of October. And you can sign up in the same way that you did this time. Um, if you are looking for any updates to that, then Twitter is a great place to, to spot us, either via Julian or the CSOT Learning account. And that's also how you can get in touch with, with anyone in CSOP. But, uh, and if you have any questions, then please do, as Julia mentioned, just drop us a line. Okay, I sit, don't see any questions here yet in the chat. Um, so I'm going to just say, finally, um, thank you for, to everyone for attending this session today. Um, we really do appreciate your feedback. So if you have any thoughts on the, the format of this or the content that Julian has described, as we've said, please don't hesitate to get in touch. And it leaves me to thank Julian once again. Thank you, Julian, for today. And so I just put a message there. Thank you. Would love a copy of the book, sir. I'll be in touch with you. Um, and Jenny, thanks very much. Thanks, everybody. See you, See you later. Bye, all. Bye.